watch this. All right, okay. Good uh, midday, everyone, and thank you for making uh, your way to the lecture hall, and this is a great turnout. And for those of you who are actually from UVA, congratulations for getting so far into the semester. For those of you who are visiting, I hope you've had a great time, and we've just had an intense session with faculty presentation. I have, um, uh, before um, Isla introduces our speaker today, I just want to say very quickly about uh, one important part of our academic life, which is our supporters. And, and I want to talk about the Weedham Foundation today, uh, the foundation that supports today's lecture. Um, the, um, the, the people who are associated with uh, Weedham Foundation would, would be Professor William Stone Weedham and his wife, Elizabeth Dupont Bayard, and very uh, important uh, sponsors of the school. Professor Whedon was a pioneer at the UVA, and he, he taught popular classes of East Asian architecture based, on, based at the School of Architecture, um, but he was a lot more than that. And he, uh, when he was studying at Harvard, and he became a special scholar um, under the renowned, renowned philosopher and mathematician Alfred North Whitehead. Uh, this amazing cross-fertilization of philosophy uh, and mathematics flourished as he completed his PhD at UVA on persuasion. And uh, as he became university professor, it was a very honored position to be a university professor in 1963 teaching philosophy, mathematics, logic, and linguistic analysis. For his excellence in teaching and research, he was given the Thomas Jefferson Award in 1976, the university's highest honor. I'm particularly uh, struck by uh, Professor Whedon's uh, study of the relationship between uh, philosophies of Eastern and Western traditions, between Buddhism and Platonism, and this certainly has a long tradition. If you dig a little bit deeper into the history of Western philosophy, uh, the works of Leibniz, Heidegger, and Francois Julien uh, all speak of this amazing fertilization of different philosophical traditions. Uh, today's political, economic, and cultural, environmental context uh, makes it even more important for us to think cross-culturally and think about connections between intellectual traditions. Um, I think Professor Whedon would be certainly very, very pleased that, that what seemed to be a kind of a obscure topic at his time has turned out to be a major part of our intellectual life. Um, I uh, want to say that Professor Whedon's legacy is now embodied in the form of Whedon Foundation uh, here today, represented by uh, Luke Pollock, who's the current um, uh, uh, director of the Whedon Foundation, um, Professor Whedon's grandson. So uh, I thank you so much um, with um, wholeheartedly. Um, uh, I um, want to also um, say that um, um, uh, that the the support of Whedon Foundation has also gone into not only this lecture series, but also studies uh, uh, overseas, um, um, uh, the summer um, uh, international studies and going to China. So, um, um, okay, now I would like to just hand over the podium to uh, Dean Berman for an introduction of speaker today. So uh, again, welcome, welcome uh, to all of our guests. Can you all hear me? There we go. A little better. Um, you know, I can still see seats, even the one I was sitting in. You know, for all of you who are like hovering in the back, if you come down, and if I can ask anybody who's sitting, uh, if there's a seat that's empty next to you that you've got your computer on, your backpack. If you can move it, sit in it, and slide so that everybody around the back can actually have a seat, that would be great. Uh, 
I also want to thank, uh, thank Luke and the Whedon Foundation uh, for enabling this lecture, supporting our Whedon professorship uh, that is held by uh, Shi Chao Li, uh, supporting our student travel uh, to Asia, and of course bringing uh, Yoshi here today. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I'm able to welcome uh, Yoshiharu Sukamatu uh, uh, to, to the uh, UVA School of Architecture. As our Whedon lecturer, uh, Yoshi and his wife, uh, Mamoyo Kajima, are the founding partners of the Tokyo-based architecture firm Atelier Bow Wow, uh, which I would venture to say is one of the most creative and inventive practices uh, uh, operating today and certainly in Asia. Their writings, drawings, uh, architectural works uh, in some ways can't be dissociated from each other. In fact, their many works are experiments that both uh, lead to and are emblematic of their theoretical propositions, and at the same time, uh, these inversely act as concepts to yield new tactics for the reinvention of architecture. Uh, in particular, their obsessions with uh, micro-public spaces, uh, micro-buildings, the uh, extraordinary found within the ordinary, and their writings on behaviorology, which I'm sure uh, Yoshi will be introducing you today, which investigate uh, the behaviors um, or behaving organisms and the many variables that determine uh, the situated ecosystem of the built environment and how we uh, operate across a very wide range of scales from details, furniture, to buildings uh, and uh, urbanism in the city. They have published 11 books on architecture. Uh, their architectural ideal ideas that uh, are very well known. Many of you, are, I'm sure, are familiar with the Pet Architecture Guidebook. Everybody should have one. Uh, documenting uh, companion architectures uh, that have pet-like characteristics, uh, charming micro-buildings with curious uh, shapes that are squeezed into the leftover spaces of the urban fabric, Bow Wow from uh, Post Bubble City, and made in Tokyo, the latter uh, of which includes architectures with a small a, uh, everyday architectures that are often anonymous, overlooked, sometimes strange. Uh, the, uh, some of the examples, the spaghetti shop wrenched into the space under a baseball batting center. I always like that one. Uh, and in addition to their writings, they have built over 90 uh, uh, projects, uh, built works, each of which reinterprets traditional kind of conventions, typologies, um, and programs in architecture, which I think is one of the most fascinating things uh, about their practice. They've also built more houses, you know, as a kind of practice, and every time it's uh, invented anew. Uh, Yoshi is an associate professor. Um, professor. Oh, professor, sorry. I, get, <laughs> I obviously have old data. I'm sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, he, is a, he is a professor uh, at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. He's lectured widely, taught uh, at many schools of architecture as well, including UCLA and uh, at Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Uh, and yesterday we took him hiking, uh, which, you know, was important. I, I realized we should have put this in our schedule for the students who are visiting today. Uh, since we did it for our Whedon lecture, we took him to Humpback Rock. Uh, and I, you know, he had a really nice outfit, I have to say. I, I, I want one. Um, and. Uh, uh, and he's a great hiker, so beyond all of his architectural accomplishments. So with that, I pass it over to uh, Yoshi Tsukamadu. Uh, thank you, Aira and Shija, to introduce me. And uh, it's a great honor to come to Virginia and uh, uh, speak to you. And, um, <clears throat> So um, uh, today's title is Architectural Behaviorology, Creating Better Accessibility to the Local Resources. So this is not, uh, um, it doesn't cover a whole um, range of our work, but uh, uh, this is what I'm very interested in now, so I'd like to share with you. So uh, i like to start from the, our book, Behaviorology, uh, published in 2010. And uh, it's a kind of monograph of our work. Uh, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's very diverse uh, activities. Uh, 
And then I found that behavior is something which uh, penetrates all these uh, different activities uh, which I'm always interested in. So, so uh, in, in this book, we investigate um, the, our buildings and also the city from uh, three main uh, actors of the behavior. Uh, we, the, the first one is nature and uh, light, wind, here, uh, heat, hum humidity. They behave uh, based on physical uh, disciplines. And then human, of course, uh, beha human beings behave. Uh, it's more about habits and skills, uh, and, and, and it's a little bit more, uh, how to say, arbitrary uh, compared to nature. And then the third one is building. Sounds strange because building doesn't move, but if you take a long time scale, like 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, you can observe also the transformation of the building and also repetition of the building in one place, which can be seen as the behavior of the building. So I like to ex uh, show one of the uh, uh, study on the uh, urban fabric of Tokyo, which is uh, uh, very related to the uh, idea of behavior of the building. So this is a view of uh, uh, Tokyo from uh, uh, the Metropolitan Government Observatory on the northeast direction. And you see infinity repetition of extremely tiny grains of buildings, but they are mostly houses and small apartment buildings. So Tokyo is not the city made of uh, a skyscraper. It's made of uh, uh, single family houses and small apartment. And it's, uh, the average uh, stories high is 1.5. So it's very uh, low, low, but very densely covered by buildings. And then there are 1.8 million landowner in, in, in Tokyo, so it's very difficult to, to intervene by big uh, urban planification. So <clears throat> then the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the urban fabric uh, is, uh, is uh, kind of always moving, uh, regenerating uh, by the, uh, by the, according to the lifespan of the buildings. So Japanese house has very short lifespan. It's 30 years. It's average, of course. And in compared to the Br British one, England one, it's 141 year. And uh, so this short life cycle uh, really gives a very uh, unique uh, phenomena in Tokyo. And one of the, oh yeah, this is, uh, uh, yeah. And then why this kind of uh, a city made of single family detached house has been was produced. It's because of the uh, uh, various uh, uh, several times uh, destruction uh, uh, of uh, of Tokyo. The first one is in modern era. First one was 1923 by big earthquake, and then second one was uh, the uh, World War Second. And then this is a map where the how how much uh, Tokyo was burnt out, and uh, this is a. Uh, 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 this is Yamanote line, which is a main uh, circular uh, ring, uh, how to say, kind of uh, 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 train lines. And, uh, and then two thirds, uh, 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 yeah, three times uh, uh, more surface of this area uh, were burnt out. So, and then at that moment, Japanese government uh, couldn't really uh, <clears throat> take uh, responsibility for reconstruction of the city because of the they they don't they didn't have money and then they were we were under the uh, governance of the uh, um, this uh, GHQ GHQ is just uh, Japanese uh, <coughs> people use strange word. Oh, yeah it's a governing headquarter or something like that. so <coughs> so we are not uh, independent at that moment until 1952. So only government could do was let people to make their own houses for the construction of the city. So because why single family house became very uh, the main ingredients of uh, of city of Tokyo, and then and then there is a and then the regeneration is totally up to the uh, family's initiative. So there are every thirty years there is a, a regeneration. 
and then <clears throat> and then also wooden house wooden construction always have this uh, uh, nature of uh, uh, re regeneration of uh, um, elements by elements and then in 1960s uh, based on this uh, uh, nature of the city and also based on the Japanese architecture, a uh, metabolist group, uh, including Kurokawa, Kikutake, Maki, Otaka, Kawajire, uh, they made a, a manifest uh, metabolism uh, at the opportunity of a, a world design conference. World design conference or something like that? Yeah, world design conference uh, held in first, first yeah, Held in Tokyo, and then uh, and then metabolism is very famous uh, by this manifesto, by this conference, and then this is uh, uh, the most famous monumental buildings of uh, of, uh, uh, of of metabolism, which still <laughs> exist in Tokyo, and then you you see the uh, architects in 1960s believe that the urban creation can happen by the concentration of power and capital. So the, the idea of metabolism was uh, <coughs> uh, in, translated into uh, the core, which is uh, considered as uh, almost uh, eternal element, and then replaceable capsules, which uh, is uh, in the, the, the living capsule for individuals. And then it is expected to be replaced in every 20 years. But actually, it's very difficult uh, to replace one capsule <laughs> in the right moment. So now this building is half re, uh, ruined because uh, actually the uh, sewage pipe is running through the capsule. So it's very difficult to detach them. So, but, but actually, what's really happened in Tokyo Beside this, it's, it's like this. It's a kind of a, another type of metabolism. So it's very flat and then very scattered. And no concentration of power and capital. And uh, this is one of the very uh, popular area in, Jap in Tokyo, Shimokitazawa. And then all these buildings are putting, it's uh, possibly uh, regenerated every 30 years. And, but they're always keeping the void space between buildings because in Tokyo the building doesn't touch they don't touch each other they are all stand alone buildings so <clears throat> the every construction produces gap space between buildings and then the, if the property is enough big you can have a garden and house with but the, in Tokyo the property is very small so it's this leftover space became just a dead space and gap space in, in, the, in the city. So I call this void metabolism on compared to the 60s metabolism, which I call this core metabolism. And within this uh, nature, there is a, see, several interesting phenomena. So one, is, one of that is suburban. It's a subdivided suburban. And uh, I did a study on, in this Okusawa area. Uh, it's already 94 years old. It's, this study was 10 years old. And uh, it's about how the, the first generation of uh, suburban development has been uh, swallowed by the urbanization and then uh, subdivided into small pieces. So this is a view of the area. And then you, you don't see any visual order. It's very random. And, uh, and behind this uh, uh, randomness, there is a se several uh, reasons. And, and the first one is the subdivision of the property. Uh, is this some, some, some sort of, a, uh, OK, <laughs> signal. <laughs> OK. So it's uh, constantly subdivided into small pieces. It's why? Uh, that is a, a very high rate inheritance tax in Japan, over 50%. So this is uh, based on the uh, philosophy to distribute, redistribute the fortune to, to, uh, to the citizens. So, <clears throat> so, so the inheritance tax is very high. So if the price of land lies extremely high, then it's become very difficult for next generation to 
receive the property and house from the from their parents. So, for example, in this area, Oksawa, in 1980s, uh, late 1980s, we had a bubble economy, and uh, the 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 land price went up, and uh, it was, for example, 250 square meter. Uh, it's not big in compared to in, uh, the house in the United States, but it's, it's still uh, quite good size in Tokyo, 250 square meter, maybe 2,500 uh, uh, square feet, yeah, something like that. And then <coughs> it cost, it's, the price of that land was three million dollar. So, so if you are a single child and, and then you inherit this property from your parents, you have to pay half of that price. So 1.5 million dara, can you do that? So it's most of the uh, normal employee can't afford to pay it, so they divide the land into small pieces. So this is, this um, accelerated the subdivision of the property. But the, the regional relation is totally up to the initiative of each family. So some family can really survive. And then we can still see the first generation in this area. So this is the first generation from 1920s. And then you don't see the house because the garden is, uh, the, the, the tree is well, well too much grown. And then this is a, uh, t the original uh, landscape of this uh, neighborhood uh, with green hedge at the, um, the borderline to the street. And then in 1950s, this is second generation. So the property became a little bit smaller, and then they start to have a garage. And then, <coughs> but they still have a strong preference to cover the building by green. And then this is third generation after 1980s. So the property was bought by the developer. And then the developer subdivided them into small pieces and built this kind of uh, house to sell. And then this is a kind of uh, a history of the uh, Japanese single family house topology. And uh, it's a kind of history of um, uh, losing generosity. So they lost the garden, they lost the quasi exterior space, they lost the big windows. And then now we don't know what is happening inside of the house. And uh, there is uh, many sad news like uh, domestic violence and, and also the single old man uh, died alone and discovered after two months of his death, for example. This kind of news is uh, very, um, <clears throat> in, always in the, in, the, in, the, in the newspaper. So, so theoretically, this, uh, uh, yeah, we have a 19 years uh, history of uh, detached house uh, suburban development. It started from 1920. And then the life average of the house is 30 years. So theoretically, the, the uh, suburban development have already experienced uh, regeneration twice. And after 2010, all the houses, new houses, should be considered as fourth generation. So I made a kind of premise to design the fourth generation house by watching this uh, 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 the tendency of 20th century houses, which lost, uh, uh, which became too pure for nuclear family and too much interiorized or introverted, and uh, uh, the produce a lot of uh, gap space between buildings. So we, the, this is uh, the three premise of fourth generation, the space with non-family members more opportunity to stay outside of the house and redefine the gap space. So this doesn't tell anything about the forms and, and uh, uh, the styles of the building, but uh, I think this uh, is quite important to share among architects. So I'd like to show one of the examples, House and Atelier Bauhaus, wow, where we are living and working. So this is live, live work environment. So this is uh, uh, section drawings, uh, and then you see the lower two levels are office, and then upper two levels are house. But this uh, living room, we call this living room, but uh, this is a kind of chamber between house and office. So you can find um, mixed behavior uh, in this 
area. There is only one entrance, and so you have, I have to pass through the office in order to go to my bedroom. And um, no, if I have, if I'm rich, I can make two different houses. So. <laughs> Ah, no, no, one house and one office. But uh, I, I, since uh, I didn't have enough money, so I made it in one place. But it's quite e efficient because it's 24 hours building, so you don't lose any heat uh, in winter in winter time um, in the building during the night. So we can really enjoy this heat uh, produced by the people and the computers and etc. <laughs> in the building and <laughs> yeah okay so this is this is a house it's built in the uh, property which is uh, i didn't explain it which is uh, um, built in this kind of a property which is called frack pole site it's uh, produced by the uh, subdivision of the property so it's very difficult to make a kind of a an open uh, gesture building. Uh, this is a, a minimum uh, uh, requirement from the uh, building code uh, for to make your property buildable in the legal sense. So, okay. So we bought this property and then designed this house. So the house is hidden from the public street. So I, we, we receive many guests and we always, uh, and then many of them lost. They can't find uh, my building because uh, there is no facade on the street. And so this is an entry. And then, so, it, yeah, so it's hidden. So we try to cover, finish the building with very soft materials with a sharp edge. So I call this pyjama type of a facade. So, <laughs> so it's a, it's a, the, all the corner is welded by the um, uh, how say, uh, asphalt, uh, uh, asphalt roofing, okay, asphalt seat. And one, yeah, you, if you enter in the house, so you see the office on both floors. So the staircase is a bit, uh, um, how do you say, distorted according to the, um, the shape of the building and also the uh, organization of the space. So the space is all connected. So it's uh, quite important to have these radiators to heat and cool the building. We pump up the well water from minus 40 meters underground to squeeze the energy from that and then recharge again into another well. So this really helps us to keep this all the space open. And then, <coughs> so there is a, this kind of a connect, visual connection between, for example, we are now sitting on the uh, dining space with uh, watching my staff working. So this is the living room, which is uh, gray, covered by the, this uh, uh, window. And um, try to keep this room as uh, open as possible because uh, we need a certain very open gesture to receive the non-family members from outside of the, and then this room really uh, work well, and of course office also work well. And then it's a kind of gap space between buildings. So we have one meter diff gap space between with the next building, but we found this wall is quite interesting with a lot of texture. So we borrow this wall as a, our wallpaper, and then to enjoy the change of the shadow on it. So now the landing, one of the landing is uh, occupied by models. And we have the, uh, 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 the terrace on the north side to enjoy uh, uh, lunch and dinner and drinking. Uh, in order to try to, to, how do you say, get the gap space between building as much as possible into our territory. So uh, this is uh, okay. The reality of uh, one of the reality of a house in Tokyo. I like to show another type of reality now in Japan. And then this is uh, we uh, yeah. Uh, so it, this map shows how 2011 uh, Tohoku earthquake hit the entire coast of 
this, this coast of, of Japan. It's 300 me kilometers long. And then we, <coughs> we were involved uh, to, to help, uh, uh, involved into the recovery project of those areas, especially three areas, uh, one in Kamaishi, one in Oshika Peninsula, and then one Minami Soma, very close to a nuclear power expo, nuclear power plant of Fukushima. And then today I'd like to show Oshika Peninsula. Um, <clears throat> this is a peninsula. There are 28 small uh, uh, bay, and then at the deep inside of the bay, there is always a small fisherman's village, and then they are all very independent. They are very competitive. They don't want to unify. So, um, yeah, it's also yeah, one, of, one, one of the possible scenarios was to unite them and then create a larger fisherman's village uh, from the, to, to gather the, the population in this peninsula. Because this peninsula have already confronted the, uh, dec dec uh, the dead population uh, from before the earthquake. But then earthquake really uh, accelerated this um, uh, dead population. And, um, but uh, they are very interesting people. They are, they are very independent. So they didn't want to be united. And so <clears throat> um, we were uh, 14 different uh, university and, uh, and laboratory run by architects went to those 28 villages, uh, small villages, to, to hear the voices of the village people. So one of the villages is Momonora. Ah, this is a samurai hammer. Yeah, it, but this is a very typical um, fisherman's village landscape in 1960s. So uh, the sea dike is very low, and then the water is always watched from the houses. And um, <coughs> the most of the uh, construction of the building is built by the timber from the mountain. And so there is a very uh, close network of uh, forest and water and uh, construction. And then this is uh, after tsunami, 2011. And then, and then government this time uh, tried to uh, take, uh, um, try to initiate uh, the recovery process. If you compare to the, uh, the possible um, reconstruction, it's very different. So government, uh, first of all, first of all, uh, designated the lower area, a non-inhabitable area, and then promised the people to make a new residential area on up on the hill. And then <coughs> there are two different uh, way to make uh, uh, kind of the, uh, the new land. Uh, yeah, but the, and then we were uh, asked to find the uh, appropriate place to make a new residential area on top of the hill, uh, <clears throat> discussing with uh, our village people. And then, so this is, uh, ah, we are, uh, yes, I, I said uh, we were 14 um, architects and uh, students at uh, university. We are uh, part of the ArchiAid. This is a volunteer network of architects. Uh, um, to help the recovery process. And so we visit uh, uh, with the village people in the uh, this destroyed village, and also we went on the mountain and then found there are tons of uh, cedar trees, which is unmanaged uh, from 1980s. So <clears throat> we saw it's quite, I say, it's, yeah, those houses were built by timbers from their uh, mountains, but um, I think it could be replaced. This network could be replaced by industry today of for house 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 construction industry. So what we did was uh, almost like an ethnographer. Um, the, we hear the voices of the people and how was the life and how. So th th this interview it was not about the building. It was about lifestyles and the rhythm of the uh, 
rhythm of their life and then the relationship with nature and their religious and you know, many things. So we naturally went into the process of uh, um, ethnography uh, study. And then based on this uh, hearing, we made this kind of sketch um, the showing the relationship between water, uh, sea and mountain and, 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 and then also we put several uh, potential site for uh, the new residential area on top of the hill. But uh, uh, we also propose new facility on the lower area in order to reactivate this fisherman's village. <coughs> and then we also realized that uh, the, the number of uh, uh, people who wants to come back this damaged area uh, became uh, smaller and smaller. So we wanted to uh, encourage them to think about a better future. So we proposed a tiny little house, which called Hoa House, uh, to let them think about new house. So we can, this is a house you can build with uh, like um, seven, uh, 30, no, 70,000 70, dollars. And it's, it's possible by, with uh, uh, half of this cost can be covered by the subsidy from the government. And then only 35,000 uh, was uh, kind of their, their, their money. So, and then most of the case, the fishermen are uh, a, very old and then they are only, um, husband and wife, old husband and wife, the kids already went out from the village and living in a much larger city. So the small house fits their lifestyle. So, and then, but uh, we also propose uh, this system to, which can be e easily um, expanded into this way. So once they start fishing, they can easily earn money. So, and we want to introduce the, the very old construction method called Itakura. Uh, it's a system, it's a half prefabricated system of wood. And uh, it's very, it's, this system is utilized for shrines and uh, storage buildings for a long time in the history, in the, in the past. But nowadays it's not uh, utilized so much, but uh, recently, the group of SCARA um, study a lot on this uh, method and then uh, made a new standards for this method fits to today's building code, like uh, fireproofing uh, profiles, etc., performance, etc. So, <clears throat> and then construction is very um, quick. So uh, just, yeah, since it's small house, we, we only spend two days to make it. And then once uh, the, the construction is, uh, <clears throat> once the structure is done, the interior finishing is already there. Okay, so it's like this. It's a very, it smells very good. Yeah. <laughs> it's all made of cedar tree. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> and, but the, but the what, act, but the, and then I, I try to get convince fishermen to build these houses, these houses, but um, actually, no, they they don't want to do that because they get used to live in a very large house, so they didn't want to live in such tiny house. So, <clears throat> so this is, for example, the typical fisherman's village in this area. It's a very beautifully organized. Uh, fitting to the landscape, and uh, also it's uh, very beautifully organized with uh, their uh, everyday uh, livelihood, everyday work. Um, <coughs> and but uh, uh, and then in 1933, this area was also hit by a uh, tsunami, and um, at that time there was, uh, yeah this uh, remove of the uh, old village into the, a little bit higher place also happened. Also, um, 
the new residential area was also built in 1933. But uh, the um, building itself are uh, quite okay. It's uh, still very traditional and uh, with uh, the technique of uh, our local carpenters and timbers. So these details are quite amazing. But uh, what actually happening now in today is this kind of landscape. It's, this is a, a photo by uh, my friend's uh, a photographer, Takashi Honma, in 1998, about Tokyo suburbia. And it almost looked like Tokyo suburbia today. So it's because the, the, the construction is really uh, done by the house makers, and they are all from Kataru. And, um, <clears throat> and then fishermen are very competitive. So if he built the house with one company, company A, and then he don't want to make same the house with from same company, so they he make building from house he buys a house from company B, and then he buys a house from company C, D, and then so it will it's totally resemble to the uh, housing park a kind of. A, uh, model sh show showcase of uh, those the 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 pre prefab housing in in near Tokyo. So what is happening now is yeah this is still yeah this process was, was still this uh, has a arrow following this arrow of 20th century that uh, construction and industrial in industry bring people from ethnographical network into industrial society network, creating a kind of a, a strong canalization between nature to industry. And uh, the public the authority also helped to make it, make this canal. This canal can also appear as a barrier for people to access to the resources. So in this case, uh, they, they have uh, tons of uh, cedar trees behind the, the port, but uh, actually the construction materials for those houses are from Canada or United States. And so this is a kind of barrier produced by the market during 20th century, and then now people are really uh, should pay to get the resources through this industrial society network. But I think now it's, but the fishermen's life is is still. We can say that they are they are, they are living uh, very close to this ethnographical network. They and then, but actually, they are very hybrid. Of course, they use cell phone, smartphone. They use our uh, radar to catch the crowds of uh, fish in the water, and they use uh, very high speed boats, and so they they are totally using this industrial society network as, as well as ethnographical network. So they are very interesting hybrid people. So, but the people living in the city don't feel that we are hybrid. We are totally dependent on this network. But I think now architectural design can find the barrier or too strong canalization uh, to industrial society network and then tackle them and then resolve this war barrier or make a kind of another canal between people and resource to bring people into this proper hybrid position. So um, the core house, this uh, Itakura method, is now utilized for another project and uh, with a, a house maker. This housemaker is a very new housemaker, and then they are very interested in our approach. So we work together to make this uh, house made of um, um, basically the wood from Japan and materials from, from Japan. And so, okay, let's shift the topic a little bit to the public space. So we, after behaviorology, five, af five years after the behaviorology, we published this book, Commonalities, discussing the, uh, more, cons more about the behavior, how behavior can appropriate open space in the city to give a, a sense of public space. So one chapter uh, dedicated for 
uh, observation of interesting appropriation of open space in the city in many different uh, parts of the planet. And uh, we drew these kind of drawings to describe it. So this is a, a case from Copenhagen. People uh, sit on the sidewalk, leaning down on the, uh, towards uh, this stone balustrade, watching the sunset at the last moment. So, and then, so this is like this. And then people on the bike, uh, they are wearing jackets. So bec it's because late summer and uh, 6 p.m. So it's a bit chilly, but uh, they are wearing just t-shirts and drink beers and sing music with guitar. And, and what are they, they are doing is enjoying the sunset, but on feeling the warmth from this stone balustrade. So stone balustrade absorbs the heat from the sun during the afternoon. And then now they are enjoying the radiation from, from this balustrade. So there is interesting uh, synchronicity or uh, in integration or, I don't know, the encounter of two different behavior of heat and human beings uh, in, this be in this place. So I think this kind of uh, uh, synchronous or synthesize of different type of uh, behavior uh, is, uh, is, a, is a kind of emergence of uh, architectural intelligent, intelligence. So another example is uh, Hanami cherry blossom in Japan. It's the most cheerful moment of, of Japanese society. Uh, people naturally go out from the house and then uh, enjoy this uh, uh, broom uh, of, uh, of cherry. It's, it's also understood as the synthesis of two different behavior. The one is the animal behavior of cherry once they blossom, and then and the other is daily behavior of the people, drinking and eating. So just bringing the daily behavior, they appreciate the arrival of the spring under the cherry. So the third example is uh, uh, the case in Barcelona, which is a bit tricky case. And um, this uh, area is called Rocket. I found this in 2006 um, when I taught at the uh, B arc and um, one of the students introduced me this square. I when I went there, I found it resemble a little bit like the Andalusian uh, village, and then it's because it's 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 true because the area is uh, fastly illegally occupied by the migrants from uh, Andalusian P, uh, area in 1930s to help the construction of the expansion of the Barcelona. And then they bring the, they work on the construction site and every day they brought bricks in their pockets and then build their own house on this steep hill side in the weekend. So it's, it's, it's because it looks like an Andrusia. But nowadays it's of course consolidated as part of Barcelona municipality. They have public infrastructure and uh, recently, no, not recently, 10 years ago, they also had a, a metro. And then this square is built on the roof of a metro station with very nice view to Barcelona, to Mediterranean Sea here. But there is no one on this side. And but many guys on another side watching something and I, oh, they are enjoying the birth. This is a hobby of Andalusian guys. And, but the architect who, who I think, who architect who worked on this project, they didn't know or they just ignore this kind of behavior of the people living in this neighborhood. And then they, if they know that, they can design this bus rate, handrail, with some device to hang or put the birth cage and let them enjoy both nice view to Barcelona and birth. <laughs> but since this kind of consideration is missing, the behavior of the guys appears very unsophisticated manner. <laughs> so this is a kind of mistake by architects. It's, a, it's not a mistake by people. I think uh, young, uh, I think, uh, yeah.
So the, based on this kind of observation, we constantly develop certain um, projects, almost like micro public space. And uh, under uh, on most of the case, it's uh, in the, under the framework of art triennial or binary. So in, the K in 2015, we are invited by Bruges Triennale to, and then they ask us to make something in the city. And then we found, you know, we, I was working with an artist um, who, who was born in Bruges and who is in charge of uh, uh, production of the pieces uh, in this Triennale. And then around here, he start talk about how people swam in this canal um, 40 years ago. And then also he also talked about the city now wants to encourage people to swim again in the canal. And then I said, oh, it's a very interesting scenario. So let us design something for this uh, program. So <clears throat> this is uh, a 1976. People swam in the canal, but uh, it's prohibited from 1977 till 19, uh, 2015 because of the pollution uh, of, the, of the water. But the sewage system um, was um, <clears throat> improved now, and then water quality get better. Now it's ready to swim, but the, it's still utilized just by canal tour boats. And then there is a barrier, mental barrier among people to swim again. If you swim there, you, if you swim there alone, you are considered as a crazy man or crazy person. But if 100 people swim together, I think it becomes totally okay. Huh? <laughs> so there is uh, some uh, uh, restrictions of, about construction, like uh, this tiny little plant is kind of uh, evidence that Bruges used to be international port because this is an indigenous um, uh, plants of, uh, of Belgium. It's only, it's, uh, it's a plant from South America. So they keep it as a kind of uh, evidence and we shouldn't touch this K. And then this is uh, uh, our structure we, we, this we built uh, on the water. It's floating on the water, on the pontoon and with uh, uh, this kind of pagora, which, which allow air and light can penetrate, but uh, uh, stop, catch the rainwater. And then it's, uh, the, the opening was May 20. Water temperature was 11 degrees, so no one, <laughs> no one in the water. But in June, it was extremely hot. So high school kids start swimming and then occupy the, whole, the canal because uh, the Bruges receive five million tourists a year, and then there are only 100,000 inhabitants. So most of public space is occupied by tourists. Cafe is uh, transformed into tourist-oriented. So this water, open water, is a really precious local resources for citizens, but uh, for a long time it wasn't accessible. So now, this is a kind of device to, to make an, uh, to lower the barrier to the water and then reactivate the skills of people about swimming. And uh, imagine the people who used to swim in this canal, they used, they, they, they were teenagers. No? So now they are late 50s or early 60s. So they can still swim. So they bring their grandson and teach uh, swimming in the canal. So it's a very nice uh, teaching and learning environment. It's a very important uh, condition uh, to make uh, good public space. Okay, like this. And another, uh, the last year we did the fire foods, uh, foodies club in uh, Shenzhen. Uh, Shenzhen uh, by city uh, art and architecture and urban binary. So the venue was Nantu Old Town. It's a very interesting urban village in, within this super modern, um, uh, tropical modern uh, uh, city. 
So, but the, it's very, they show very strong contrast. So in the modern area, there are many greens like this. It's, it grows too fast. Yeah? They, all, they all always have to cut the branches. Then tons of biomass, bio debris, is produced inside of the city, but they just throw it now. So I want, and then in the urban village, there is many uh, restaurants who cook in front of the shop. Uh, and then I, I think it's quite nice to, to link this biomass debris and this cooking by fire. So simply I imagine, okay, so this is a modern part of Shenzhen and then this biomass debris can make fire for the people living in urban village and like this. So we need big chimney. <laughs> <laughs> so we designed the three big chimney hung from the uh, uh, steel frame. So this is the opening. Uh, many events happen. It's very strange. <laughs> but, um, but this is, uh, yeah, but uh, actually, <clears throat> One month before the opening of the exhibition, uh, Shenzhen local government launched a new law to prohibit using real fire outside of the building because of the pollution issue of the air. And then, so we, are, we can't really burn the uh, bio debris under this uh, um, chimney, but uh, I, I really wanted to do something, so we did the hot pot. <laughs> yes, it's um Yeah, it doesn't make sense so much. But <laughs> okay. But this is also kind of accessib about accessibility to local resources. So the debris uh, can be garbage, can be resources if you find a better framework. Uh, okay, so um, can, can I continue? Okay, so I, I like to yes, show the, another type of project and more about facility. So Koisura Buddha Laboratory is built in this beautiful farming landscape. It's a very complex landscape. It's near Narita Airport. So um, the, there is a um, series of valley run, run, uh, how to say, going into the uh, um, hill. So this is a um, lower area going into it, another lower area like this. And the lower area is always cultivated as rice paddy. And then upper part, uh, there are vegetable farms. And then all the slope site is plant is covered by cedar tree, which were uh, planted in 1950s, 60s. So now they are 70, 60 years old. So it's time. It's uh, they are now becoming quite good timber. But the um, forest management is not. It's it's almost forgotten in this area. Oh. But okay, I have to explain Koisurubota Laboratory. This is an NGO group um, who runs, oh yeah, this is a beautiful landscape of the area, who runs uh, uh, several uh, uh, social uh, uh, welfare uh, facilities like uh, daycare center or elderly homes, etc. But they found that they, 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 they need to produce a job for disabled people in this area because many uh, disabled people can just uh, uh, spend time in a, a, a kind of a facility who doesn't really pay well, so then they can't be independent. They can't really uh, make their own life. So <clears throat> they found that it's possible to, give, to produce job by combining local resources and uh, um, this uh, social welfare program. And the chair of uh, this NGO uh, have a, a pork business. So he decided to make a restaurant and ham and sausage factory at, uh, in order to produce jobs for disabled people. And then the area is, yeah, th this is uh, 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 our neighbor, which is a, a roadside station. And then they sell uh, very uh, good uh, vegetables from the area. And then they are full of uh, 
uh, visitors always. But it always appears, this type of building always appears behind the big parking space. And then it shows how, how much traffic culture is invading into the farming culture. And then, but I think this uh, Koisul Buddha laboratory shouldn't appear in this manner. So it should be appear, it should appear something like this, Villa Barbarlo <laughs> by Andrea Paradio. So it's a kind of villa in Vicenza. And uh, trying to make a building as big as possible by making this uh, a wing uh, to demonstrate uh, the size of the building um, uh, larger than the reality. This is a kind of invention of uh, Palladio. And then we did the same, uh, uh, just we take same gesture, having this uh, long lodger space uh, and in order to uh, bring people from this hidden parking space at the deep part of the property. And then the, the main building is uh, um, built with four different roofs com uh, forming one big roof. And then, so this is a lodger space, a double uh, layer lodger. And I'm very happy to show these slides today. <laughs> I actually, I'm very much inspired by <laughs> Jefferson's <laughs> lawn, this Palladian villa with loggia connecting uh, yeah. several pal uh, 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 Palladian villa, and then creating a kind of a half open cloister typology, which is a, a quite interesting hybrid between uh, uh, villa and the cloister. And um, I, yes, this is, uh, yes. <laughs> our, our translation of a Palladian villa in our context. So now it looks like this. Mm -hmm. So upstairs it's a, a restaurant of a sh a pork shab shab. Downstairs is uh, our ham and sausage factory. And uh, uh, 20 disabled people are working here. This is a, a view of the restaurant. So the area, the, 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 the building is uh, surround, in, how do you say, in, in closed by the uh, ribbon window, which um, <coughs> uh, give a chance uh, to the people to see the uh, cedar trees surround the building. So this cedar, forest uh, can, it, it, it appears everywhere from inside of the house. And then one day, this NGO group start to thin and then produce firewood from this uh, adjacent wood. And because they have three uh, uh, stove um, and then they need firewood. And then people, visitors start asking them, why don't you sell this uh, firewood? And then this NGO group found, oh, it can be another business to produce job, another project. So another project is called the Kunimoto Daiichi Firewood Supply Station and 1K. So <coughs> by thinning this unmanaged forest from 1980s, it's unmanaged, um, they produce firewood and then make forest healthier and uh, produce job for disabled people. And then this is a new actor network for this project. I draw it uh, based on the uh, story uh, of, from this NGO group. So connecting different type of actors from the city, from the uh, farming area, and, uh, and yeah. And, but the, 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 what was surprising for me was this uh, uh, device, uh, it's a splitter, and uh, this energy group uh, sent me pictures that this is a barrier-free device for our project. Because uh, introduce, yeah, I think it's still hard to involve the disabled people into our forest management. You use uh, this kind of uh, ax and uh, it's me, I'm uh, a little bit scared by using it. But this is much safer and easier. So this, they said, this is a very free device. 
And then I was really surprised because uh, in School of Architecture, barrier free is always about connecting to different levels, putting slopes and putting elevators in the plan. So, but there are so many different types of barriers in the society. So I we start uh, draw the, this kind of um, um, the, uh, um, the diagram to understand the whole process of uh, forest management and the production of the firewood, and together with my students, and then find several uh, uh, process can be uh, available, can be possible, accessible for disabled people. And um, <clears throat> it's a very, a very graphic project, but uh, I think it's also tackling the barrier. So it, in that sense, it can be an architectural project. And then we, and then every this box, each each uh, process uh, sh should be um, instructed by the manual. So we design also this kind of manual and uh, how to use the chopping uh, the splitter. And um, all the Chinese characters should be accompanied with uh, uh, hiragana in order to make uh, 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 easier to read for anyone. But um, since my students are tech students, so they use very abstract words. So the first draft was totally became red by the checking by the NGO group. So in that sense, there is also barrier in word. So our, our language also, the, the words also can, can be the barrier for the, for the disabled people. So, and then we also start uh, searching the uh, potential ability of uh, uh, fire, of uh, uh, forest industry in this area. And then we met uh, uh, basically two guys, two guys, one is uh, uh, Mr. <coughs> Zasawa, uh, and then um, Miyazawa, who runs a uh, uh, fire, a uh, uh, wood mill in this area, but they are almost, their, their activity is uh, really shrinking now. And then especially the, um, after the big earthquake, this area w was also shaped by, by 2012 earthquake. So the storage of uh, uh, fire, uh, storage of the, the wood were also, uh, how to say, uh, collapsed in this manner, but it's not totally collapsed because of the wood. And uh, so this is uh, uh, our new uh, uh, factory, just next to this uh, Koisur Buta laboratory. And, um, and then we have a sweet potato farm. So this is tiny pavilion to produce a sweet potato uh, cake. And uh, so, so now we have a pork, we have a sweet potato, we have wood. So local resources are fully utilized in order to produce the job for disabled people. And also opportunity for, peop for the city people to come this farming area to, to see what is actually happening. And uh, so we were insisted on designing this, uh, building this uh, new building with local timber. So we went into this wood and cut several uh, cedar tree for the um, columns and beams and uh, uh, all the cladding. And um, so it's a uh, quite good wood. Mm. Yeah, and then, oh, this is a, a structure, yes. And um, yeah, it's a very simple barn typology. So next to the Palladium Villa, we have a barn typology. But uh, uh, translated in uh, today's manner, and kids enjoy uh, cropping sweet potato. And um, this is a day of uh, the the uh, ritual to celebrate the completion of the structure, uh, completion of the structure. And uh, <clears throat> uh, yes, we throw the rice cake from normally from the rooftop, but uh, this time from this first level. 
yeah, to the people who gather. And we had uh, 400 people come to, to catch this um, because um, it was Saturday. So there are many customers of uh, Koisuru Buddha Laboratory who tried to enjoy the uh, shabu shab came to also came to catch the rice cake and then also hundred architectural uh, the the students and the media came to see this event. Uh, oh, yes, and this is um, uh, today's the final uh, products. Yeah, but we still have to wait for the moment when the sweet potato becomes um, green. And uh, yeah, so the, all the columns are uh, just log. And um, yeah, it's a very simple building, but um, yeah. And this is a log boiler. It, it can provide all the heat for this building. The center part is uh, working space, and um, yeah, 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 yes. Uh, again, it's again very mixed. This is a working space factory, and this is a daycare center for elderly people. So senior who is in good form can work also, can enjoy chopping wood. And then this is a office space for this facility, but uh, it is a kind of a share office uh, by the a group of um, uh, for the group of uh, com uh, companies who are uh, who who help this project. Okay. Mm. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. The structure normally Japanese construct wooden construction have very heavy roof, and um, la but this time we try to make roof as light as possible, but uh, while keeping the kolan as heavy as possible. <clears throat> so we change the proportion of the uh, the uh, the weight uh, arrangement, disposition of the weight of the uh, in the building from to top to down. This is the daycare center. And this is a share office. Yes, yeah, it, yeah. The fourth of uh, April, the facility start its activity, so you can see this kind of uh, activity. Mm. Cash fire. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Ah, too many. Yes, sweet potato cake. Yeah. <laughs> and upstairs, it's a kind of. It's a, uh, uh, you can stay on reading books, watching the landscape. And can I go a little, 10 minutes more? Yeah, okay, and then, okay, all right. So we go back, let's go back to Oshika Peninsula, the damaged area in Tohoku. So, uh, so after several years of, uh, of uh, to work together with fishermen, uh, uh, we started the fishermen's school together with fishermen. So this is not, uh, we, we don't fa have any facility. It's a, just a kind of exchange of the skills, how to live confronting with sea. And uh, so the first class was held in the, a temporary sh um, uh, shelter for the, sh the temple in this uh, town. So student, five to 10 students every time for three days, learn how to work for an oyster farm, how to fish um, in the close, uh, near the coastline, and how to cook fish. And then after a series of uh, uh, fishermen school, eight uh, uh, fishermen school uh, started to focus on the relationship between a sea and forest. Because we, at this time, we already realized that uh, if we can bring the new people from outside to this fisherman's community, because the main issue is uh, this lack of successor. And there's no young people who wants to succeed this uh, fishing business. So 
in order to bring the uh, newcomer from outside, they have to know what is the life of a fisherman. This is the main uh, uh, objective of, uh, of uh, a fisherman school. But uh, we realize that the government only allow to make uh, a, residential, a new residential area on top of the hill for the people, for original villager who wants to come back to the, to the village. So there is no consolation about the newcomer from outside. And so we start thinking about how to produce uh, the place for newcomer to stay in this area. And then, so this forest is abandoned for almost 30 years, 40 years. So let's cut those trees and then produce timber and then create also the place for newcomer. And uh, then, but now it is a, a kind of um, camping site and the learning center of uh, the life in the nature. And it's called Momonora Village. So uh, we cut the trees and then tr process trees. We ask uh, the uh, wood mill to make our, our construction timber. So um, yeah, this is already uh, cut, uh, after the condition to cut the trees, to create a kind of open space, watching to the sea. And then, um, yes. And then we, we organized also summer school in 2017, last summer, and in order to uh, build a tiny houses for stay. And then those tiny houses are designed by young architects. And uh, we built together with the students who wants to know, to learn how to build house by themselves. And um, so this is uh, uh, the campus of not campus, but the whole compound of this uh, Momonora village. This is a build, very cheap building designed by Bawao, by, by us. It's very cheap building, so. And uh, <coughs> so two, two more uh, tiny house, but we are planning two more tiny house inside of, of this forest. It's, uh, uh, this here you can stay, and, uh, and then fishermen, uh, can teach you how to fish, how to uh, work in the wood, how to cook, and uh, so they, you, you gradually know how to live in this kind of environment. So again, this is a kind of wrap up my, my, my discussion today. So this is, um, it's a very, it's uh, maybe too, too, too much s simple, but um, now we are living in this uh, hybrid condition, but um, uh, the architecture design can really bring people uh, back and find the appropriate mode of a hybrid because ha we don't have a words to describe this kind of uh, uh, com uh, complex condition. We only have word hybrid. But um, there are many, probably many different type of hybrids. So we have to uh, invent new words to to distinguish the, the possibility of uh, being inside of this hybrid zone. And uh, I think architectural design can play an important role in this uh, uh, process. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah.